Hello and welcome. When we decided to invite David Berry to speak about his book, A People's History of Tennis, I knew exactly the person to interview him. James Munro is a former BBC sports correspondent, former director of communications at the Lawn Tennis Association, and he lives in Chiswick. I'm delighted they've both said yes. So James, over to you. Thorin, thanks very much indeed. And welcome everyone to the Chiswick Book Festival. Now, if I was to say the words lawn tennis to you, what would be the first thing that comes into your mind? I, I suppose for many people, it's going to be Wimbledon, perhaps strawberries and cream, manicured lawns, or even tennis whites. But I wonder if it's a time now to take a different look at what's become one of the world's most played and most watched sports. So it is great to have David Berry here today, a writer, journalist, and filmmaker. We'll hear a bit more about him um, later on. And David, your book, A People's History of Tennis, does challenge that perception of tennis as a sport for the establishment, doesn't it? And, and paints instead a picture of a truly radical sport. Yes, it does. Hello, James. It's really nice to be here and be part of the festival. Um, I think it, it, I wanted to challenge it because I never felt that it was my experience of actually playing the game or indeed watching it. It always felt much more complicated than that. And every year that I saw these images at Wimbledon, I thought, well, actually, no, that's not me. And that's not all the tennis players I know. So, I mean, let's start with that, your passion for tennis. Tell us, how did it start and what does tennis mean for you? I think it's got more important as I've got older, but certainly and I can date back the time I played till I was 12 and I was in a, a, a local kind of gang in my sort of council estate. We used to play football and cricket or so, but then one of, the, one of my friend's mothers was a Labour councillor and she was determined to kind of get tennis courts. This was in Bratnell Newtown in Berkshire. Um, and she built some, she got some tennis courts made in our neighbourhood. And of course, nobody played. <laughs> they were completely empty all summer. And my kind of gang sort of went round and started, started playing the game. And I found I was actually not bad at tennis. I was pretty awful at football, pretty awful at cricket. But actually, I could get the ball over the net for some reason. And I was actually probably the best of the, of the group. And that gave me a kind of passion for it, I suppose, an incentive, which replaced my passions of the time, which were train spotting and fishing. Um, and I started to sort of apply, as I think quite a lot of boys do, uh, all, all my energy to this new game. And I played it then pretty consistently till about 18, when I got so, so frustrated with it, that I threw my rackets away and didn't play it for 20 more years. <laughs> so I can date it back very much to that six years of my adolescence. And now you, you play regularly again? Yeah, well, I took it up again then in my 40s, like a lot of people do. And I've been playing since, really. And now I play three times a week, assuming that my back and my hips and my knees will kind of survive the battering that you get when you play tennis. Uh, yeah, and it's really an essential part of, 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 of my world. And I noticed, really, during the lockdown when we couldn't play tennis, that I started, something in, in me was actually missing, that physical and the social experience that you get out of tennis. So do you think that passion for tennis has, has given you the permission to write this book or in some ways has it made it harder to be objective about, about the premise you set out? Well, I think it's both. I think it can be both. And there's no doubt that, um, I mean, I, 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 was, I was at the BBC for a long time making documentary films and making kind of films to order, really, uh, a bit like a taxi driver. I just I was on the staff there. And I just kind of um, got allocated films to make, which is a great way of doing journalism. It was really nice. Um, but there was nothing that was really personal about it. And in some ways, that's not such a bad thing. You know, I think a lot of the BBC films uh, that go out uh, aren't personal, but they're actually very nicely made and very kind of, uh, you know, objective and journalistic. And I hope I made some of those at least. Um, but I missed having something that was my own. And when I kind of took early retirement from, from the BBC, I thought, now's the time to go back to writing and write something that I really care about. Uh, and tennis was one of the first of the topics that I thought would work. And hmm, there's no doubt that a passion for a subject really gives you the motivation for doing it, uh, especially if you're doing it in your spare time. Um, because one of the, the kind of things about writing that I love is that you're interesting yourself all the time. You're discovering new things. And if you're not passionate about something, 
and you're not getting you know paid for it it's not not not, not a kind of professional thing then you start getting bored really and so i think that passion drove me on all the time it drove me on to find out more about the subject and get more involved in it that says then you can, it can kind of occasionally sort of uh, push you to places where it becomes an indulgence I suppose and my professional training allowed me to stand back a bit and say no this is too indulgent nobody's going to read this apart from yourself <laughs> because if you put the words BBC sort of documentary filmmaker and narrative non-fiction together you've got to have that objectivity haven't you and I suppose you've got to start with a thesis or do you start with the evidence Oh, I'm very much on the former camp. And I think actually most documentaries do, or most documentaries that I enjoy watching do, um, for a very obvious reason, that there's an enormous amount of information out there. And if you start just collecting information and providing kind of facts of people, it becomes a bit, as we used to say in the BBC, the, and another thing, journalism. You know, you've got a bit of fact, and another thing, and another fact, and another fact. It doesn't have any kind of, um, you know, sort of, interest about it at all it doesn't grab people um so it was always important for me that i had a thesis of some kind a bit like landing on the moon and having a map i mean the map might be completely wrong but at least it gets you going and you might tell you there's a crater over there and it turns out there isn't a crater over there but at least you've gone somewhere and you discover something else so i learned that from, from a documentary that you have a thesis you start off with a thesis and you look for evidence that backs the thesis, but you also look for evidence that will contradict it. Um, and it might end up with something that is entirely different. You might need to revise your thesis at the end, um, but at least it gets you going, gives you that kind of push ahead, really. So give us a sense of that thesis for this book, A People's History of Tennis. What was the map, the spine of your narrative? I suppose it was from what you were saying in your introduction. There was a conflict or a contradiction between the image of tennis and the reality of my own experience. And I thought actually, you know, tennis comes across as exclusive, a posh sport, comes across as discriminatory, you know, not allowing certain people to play. And it also comes across as a very conservative sport, in the sense that, you know, it's from the leafy shires, uh, it's from people that kind of tended to vote conservative, tended to be sort of for the status quo. And all those things would, I felt, were accurate. I mean, most of the people I knew in my tennis club, admittedly in North London, were, will be on the left rather than the right. So I knew that actually it attracted a whole range of kind of liberals and mavericks and socialists and things. Um, you use it a got, year. Sorry? You use a year, I know, David. That 1936, I think you use as an example of that yes. discrepancy. Just give us a sense of 1936. Huh. If I was sitting there telling you that tennis was a traditional sport of the establishment. Yes, I mean, it was, you know, one of the high points of tennis. It was a very, you know, Wimbledon was an extraordinary, you know, gorgeous affair with all that, with um, Queen Mary was there, all these sort of uh, Hollywood actors and actresses were there. It was very kind of, you know, sort of, it seemed very exclusive. Um, but the person who won it, of course, was Fred Perry. And Fred Perry was from a very much a Labour background, even though they had got up in the world. He was very different from the kind of, you know, sort of supposed people that kind of play tennis. So that in itself was interesting, but also forgotten was um, the, the, she didn't win it that year, she won it the year before, but she was, she won it the year after. Uh, his partner in the mixed doubles uh, tournament was Dorothy Round, who was the daughter of a kind of builder from Dudley. No, she wasn't kind of, you know, sort of uh, posh at all, really. And then I started thinking about who else was playing in 1936 and that time. And it turned out, you know, when I did some research, that there are a whole range of people that are playing tennis, very, very different from the people at, at Wimbledon. There was a whole, it was the, the high point of the public parks kind of uh, tennis in which people used to queue up to play. And these weren't sort of posh middle class people. These were lower middle class people. These are working class people, particularly in the cities, Liverpool, Manchester and Birmingham. And then you looked at some of the tennis clubs and sure, there were lots of kind of exclusive clubs that are really only open to people from middle class backgrounds. But then there are a lot of other clubs, much smaller clubs, particularly in the north, that basically wanted anybody to be a member. So there was a kind of uh, underneath, there's a much more grassroots participation in tennis. So, um, so, so your sense was of a sport that perhaps reflected society maybe better than, than any other sport? I think it did. And I think it does. I think it does today, James. I mean, if you look at the class the class composition of people who are playing tennis. 
it is about exactly it is similar to the class composition of Britain. I mean, that's because we are mainly a middle class kind of country, I suppose, and tennis still has a middle class kind of feel about it. But actually, you know, most people are middle class these days. In fact, the growing ethos of, of British tennis is lower middle class, really. That's when you go out and play, as I do, in the clubs in North London, suburban North London. The people who play there are estate agents, they're kind of, you know, people, teachers, they're sort of uh, uh, clerks, they're people working in shops and things. It's not the kind of posh people that are playing in those clubs. But let's take it back to the beginning and maybe give us a sense of that history of lawn tennis. And, and, and how you describe it as marketed as, as a sport for the aristocracy, really. Yes, it was very much a commercial operation right from the very start. I, I mean, it wasn't um, a, a game that gradually evolved. It was really uh, invented, I would use the word. Some people say discovered, but I think, think the invented is, is the best word uh, by this guy called Walter Wingfield, who was ex-Indian Army. Uh, he was an entrepreneur. And he just wanted to make money. He invented all, all kinds of things, some of which were completely unsuccessful. But lawn tennis uh, was actually something that took off. And it took off for a number of reasons. It was a way in which, in the time, he aimed it very much at the sort of country house set. Uh, the people playing, uh, wanting a, a recreation in the summer. They'd been amused by croquet, but they were looking for something slightly different. And his lawn tennis has caught on with the upper middle class uh, and some of the aristocracy as well. He sold about a third of his the first sets to dukes and princesses uh, and knights of the realm, as he claimed. I mean, whether that was entirely true or not, we did make up lots of things. But um, there was the sense that that was the, the people that it was aimed at. And it became that kind of sport for, for, for only for a very short time, though. So you're point was that for many people it was an aspirational sport potentially but then and I think you talked a little bit earlier or you, you, you talked about public parks yes and the importance of of those uh, which is still incredibly relevant now in terms of tennis yes it is I mean the sport spread very quickly to the professional middle class uh, to the bankers to the lawyers to the you know to the architects and things from the aristocracy and then it sort of seemed to percolate outwards um, it was maybe because it was such a, a good game, maybe because we can talk about this in a minute, because it attracted both men and women. Oh, that's a very important point. But there's no doubt in the 1890s already, the you know, uh, tennis courts were being built by local authorities in the public parks, in Birmingham especially, uh, but in other places as well. And once they were put in public parks, they were really open, accessible to, uh, to everybody. It was also at the same time the, the development of tennis clubs. And as I said, some of those tennis clubs were, were really quite open to anybody. Um, so sport was already kind of uh, moving out from its upper middle class origins. Yeah, we'll definitely talk about that in a minute. And, and I'm sure we'll talk a lot about Wimbledon, um, probably the most famous club of all, well, certainly the most famous club of all. Mm -hmm. um, but give us a sense of those those other wider forms of clubs the miners clubs the post office clubs that you write about yes that took, that was they really came into their own in between the wars when tennis was i think and it's and it's at a point where it could have became it could have taken over from cricket as the as the second most important sport in britain and it did in other countries um, but I think I think if if some of the larger clubs had been more open than they uh, um, than they were at that time, it, it would have became a mass sport. But what happened was some of those clubs were still discriminating and excluding kind of working class people. So working class people set up their own clubs. I mean, in 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 collieries there were lots of miners' clubs. There were lots of post office workers' clubs. Uh, the Labour Party. Um, decided that if, you know, uh, in its sports and social clubs, it would try and kind of, you know, create sort of alternative structures for its members. And tennis became quite an important part. I think there were about 30 or 50 very strong Labour Party tennis clubs at the time. And then there was this tournament that I discovered um, called Workers Wimbledon. It was quite extraordinary. But for, I think it was 10 years before the war and a few years after the war, um, they had this open tournament for anybody as long as they were a part of a trade union or a Labour Party sports club or the Labour, Labour League of Youth, I think. Um, but nobody checked whether you were or not. Um, but in practice, what happened was that all these working class clubs that played tennis, they got together every year in different venues and had this, had this tournament in which uh, it was played like any other tennis tournament. 
except there was a kind of comradeliness about it. So there was a, you, you tended to congratulate the person that you kind of uh, lost to at the end and you all went down to the pub afterwards or so, which was not what Fred Perry did, <laughs> or not what the Wimbledon champions used to do. So uh, for 10, 15 years, there was this, which I think at the time they thought might actually rival Wimbledon. Um, it didn't, of course, but it was certainly provided a different image of, of the sport at the time. And when you say rival Wimbledon, I think one of the important points that comes through in your book is that tennis can inspire the people who play it, but also importantly, the people who watch it. Yes. Uh, and, and what people found by watching tennis that was perhaps different to other sports, what they enjoyed about it. Yes, I, I think, I think you, it has been absolutely crucial that tennis has been a spectator sport. I mean, there are lots of sports that, that, that um, started at the time, you know, like badminton is a classic example. Uh, that's never really became a, become a spectator sport. I mean, without the spectators, tennis would not be the worst sport it is. Without that, without that spectacle, which people are prepared to actually pay money for, you would never have the resources and the style about it that have made it a world sport. Um, and so why so, did they want to watch it? And, and, and well, what was it that attracted them to tennis? It's interesting. I, you know, I think in the end, um, you have to connect it with a sense of drama and a sense of colour and a sense of it being outside and also the ability, you know, to watch kind of uh, young men and young women play a, a play a sport. Um, and I think well, all those things started. And then you get a milieu of playing, the sense of kind of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the sort of scoring system allowed kind of that sort of gladiatorial antagonism um, between. So you, so you, 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 so people started going because it was, almost as good as going to the theatre. It wasn't simply watching a, a sport being played well, it was also being watched something that was a performance. And, that in, and, and having men and women that was actually crucial to that. You actually got a real sense of, that, of, the, of, of the tension. So all those things um, uh, attracted people to it. But what I liked about tennis when I looked at it, and I, you know, I was really quite sort of surprised by this, was how non-nationalistic it was. I mean, it's partly because it was an individual game, and partly because after about 1912, the Brits stopped dominating the sport that they'd invented. Uh, so they didn't, spectators didn't have much choice. But what you found was that actually kind of um, the Wimbledon spectators were quite, were quite sort of clever and discerning people. They brought to it an intelligence and they appreciated certain kinds of tennis. Uh, uh, that was usually the kind of tennis that was played with grace and style. And, uh, and, 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 you know, weren't that keen on, on other forms. And they weren't biased in terms of nationality. So even in 1911, I think, uh, they cheered Anthony Wilding, the wonderful New Zealand player, who unfortunately lost his life in the First World War, uh, against his kind of opponent, the rather dour Arthur Gore. Um, and, and, that, and that was already in 1911, in which, you know, the British player didn't necessarily, you know, get the hearts of Wimbledon. And that carried on all the way through in Wilmington. They've always gone for the underdog. They've always gone for the stylish player. And often somebody, you know, that isn't from, um, you know, this sort of, certainly from the British Isles or so. I mean, all the fuss about people not giving Andy Murray a, a, a great deal of, 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 of support during that time. You know, there's a whole history of a whole, whole range of British players not getting that support from women. And I think that's actually quite a good thing, you know, compared to other sports where it's, but viciously nationalistic uh, and things. I think the tennis spectator has brought a lot of, of, of things to the whole joy of watching sport. Uh, and, and you've mentioned and, and sort of alluded to on, uh, on a number of occasions there that what, what made tennis distinct right from the start was the fact that it was marketed to and played by both men and women. So yes. would you argue that that's perhaps the area where tennis has been the most radical of sports or at its I, most radical? I think you have to, James. I think you really have to think of that sense. And it's something that you kind of accept, um, you know, just as normal. Of course, people, men and women play tennis. But actually, it's much more radical than you think. Even, even today, there are very, very few sports, uh, certainly no world sports, where men and women are on the same side playing against each other as they are in, say, mixed doubles, uh, which is one of the major kind of competitions. You know, there aren't those competitions uh, amongst in football or cricket or rugby. There are very, there's men's cricket and women's cricket. But it's very separate, uh, isn't with tennis. Tennis has always been integrated in that way. 
Uh, and I started kind of going back through the history and looking at this fact again, because it had all kinds of implications. And Major Wingfield aimed his sport very much at women as well as men. It was the croquet market. It was the market for in which men and women came together to socialize and the sport grew out of that. But what it meant was that it created an etiquette and a culture and an atmosphere, which was quite different from all the other sports at the time. I mean, you didn't get the rugby scrum. You didn't get the 19th hole of golf in which kind of men were just kind of, you know, sort of meeting together effectively. You've got a culture in which men and women always had to kind of connect, to, connect with. And that created a courtesy about the sport, I think a gentleness, and a sense that the sport had to be played with the head as well as the hand. It was an intelligent sport as well, uh, in which you had to constantly kind of look at how you played the sport. And I think that was really quite radical. But the other side to that, I imagine, was and there were trailblazers like Lottie Dodd who had to ensure that that game still remained. Um, the equality of the game uh, was, was there. Yes, Lottie Dodd was, was the start of a whole range of very impressive women, uh, which go all the way through to uh, Billie Jean King. A lot of them, we can talk about this in a minute, were gay women. Um, and Lottie Dodd's sexuality has never been disclosed, but she certainly has the style of sort of a, a, a gay woman now. She's formidable. She was the daughter of an industrialist um, in, in Birkenhead, and she started playing tennis with her brothers, as quite a lot of these girls did. And that was a revolutionary thing in the sort of late, late, late 19th century. Girls were beginning to get the kind of physical freedom that, all, that boys had always had. And she learned the game from her brothers. And then she started playing in these tennis tournaments that were, uh, that were kind of uh, um, emerging. And in those tennis tournaments, it was always the mixed doubles tournament or the women's singles that were just as kind of popular as the men's, partly because people hadn't seen women do anything physical before. Um, and so Lottie was formidable. She just hit the ball as hard as a man um, she's probably, I suppose, you know, a bit like Martina Navratilova now, or, or, or we can remember Martina Navratilova, probably like Serena Williams, I think, a very similar kind of woman. And she was as hard on women as she was on men. She used to say to women, stop fluffing around, you know, you know practice, actually hit the ball hard, don't kind of just pat it back, you know, it's not a decorous game. But when she, she and her you know, fellow champions in the late 19th century uh, realized that some of the men in the sport wanted to change the game so that the women's game was actually going to be played with softer balls and smaller rackets and a smaller court because they were scared that the poor women would do themselves harm and damage. And if you remember those wooden rackets, those wooden rackets are pretty heavy and much heavier than now. But the women fought back and said, no, we want to carry on playing the same game that you are because they realized that once you started the game being separate for women, the resources would be much less and it would be much less prestigious and much less status. And they won, you know, they forced the men not to go through with that. The Lawn Tennis Association, which I think, you know, you used to work for, I think only represented men up to about 1890s or so until they were forced to represent female players as well. And that was because of Lottie and, and, and those fellow champions. And while, you know, several of them were from very upper middle class kind of backgrounds, they were privileged women, uh, the way they fought for the game that they loved, I think made them the first sporting feminists. I mean, this was 30 years before women got the vote and they were really pressing for, for, for kind of women's rights and things. Um, so I think that was quite radical. And then if you take it further, uh, several decades um, to the era of Billie Jean King and the fight for equal pay and recognition, again, um, this, this spirit of kind of a progressive rather than subversive, but very much a spirit of determination that there would be equality in the sport. Yes, it was. I mean, Billie Jean King described Lottie Dodd as a kindred spirit. Um, even though, you know, Carlotti, um, I think she, you know, uh, long, you know, she's from the 1890s. Um, and it was extraordinary that that had to kind of happen again, really, in, in professionalism, when I think um, the sort of male promoters like Jack Kramer uh, realised, or they said they realised, that men's tennis was far more attractive than, than female tennis. So therefore, they were going to pay the men three, four, five, sometimes eight times as much as the women. Um, and the women fought back and uh, they said no that we want equal pay and the way they did it the way Billie Jean King uh, did it was actually to set up a separate tour with the Virginia Slims tour which showed that female tennis was attractive to spectators um, and also at the same time they pressed 
uh, Wimbledon and uh, the other major championships to insist that the women's singles players got the same as men's. And there are lots of spurious arguments, and they still are today. You know, men play five sets, women play three sets. Um, and all that kind of stuff. But I think now the argument has been won, that it's an equal sport and that means uh, rewarding people equally. And Billie Jean King, you can't underestimate the effect that that woman from a working class background um, in, 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 in the West, in, in California or so, did uh, in, for the sport. And, and also right, right through until the support given to transgender rights in sports as well, which again, I think, you know, you could argue that, that tennis was, was at the forefront of. Well, I think you can. I mean, the first transgender athlete, uh, I think, was uh, Rennie Richards, or as she used to be known, Richard Raskind. Uh, she, she, she changed gender and wanted to carry on playing tennis. And she had to uh, go to, through uh, several court battles to get her right to play in, 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 in the US Open, which she did. Uh, Billie Jean King supported her uh, during that time. Um, so I think it has been a home, you know, for transgender athletes as well, uh, well before its time. And I think the thing I haven't emphasised as much is I do think it's been a, a great home for uh, lesbian tennis players like Billie Jean King and perhaps Lottie Dodd. Um, and certainly also, bizarrely enough, for, for, for gay male players as well. I mean, the, we all know that there aren't any kind of openly gay men in the top 500 um, of tennis players. And that's an interesting question itself. But there's no doubt throughout the sport that the influence of gay culture and style and, 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 uh, and, and campness is, is there throughout, throughout, throughout the sport. And it's always been, a, it's always been a very open sport at a grassroots level for gay men and lesbian women to play. And, and, and to your point earlier about the, the crowd and, and the favourites that they pick, that's, that's never been a barrier or an issue to the support of players necessarily at, at a, a tournament at Wimbledon, or has it? I don't think it has really. I mean, Bill Tilden was the and got Ron Cram, the two great gay male players of the, in between the wars. You know, were, were personal favourites. I mean, partly because one doesn't want to stereotype too much here, but there has been a very strong emphasis of performance and uh, and kind of style amongst kind of gay male culture. And um, Bill Tilden was certainly like that. He used to just. Um, you know, sort of tease his opponents and just kind of play to the gallery all the time. And, um, you know, constantly kind of, you know, do things because they were just amusing to do because they're stylish to do. And people loved that, they actually loved it. And Gottfried von Kram, the great German player, um, was the most elegant player that you've ever seen. I mean, he was just pure sort of style. He just looked beautiful. And uh, he had a grace about him that everybody appreciated uh, and things. And I think their kind of style very much came from their sexuality and the crowd loved both of them. One of the other areas you explore in your book is around racial identity uh, and, uh, and, and um, people's attitudes towards race within tennis. Yes. Um, and again, that's, that's you know, it's, it's not a simple topic, is it? No, and remember we were, we were talking earlier about the thesis idea and the fact that sometimes, you know, you, come, you, you have to find evidence that disproves the thesis. It's certainly the kind of, the, the sort of, I don't think tennis has been amazingly radical in terms of how it's treated kind of uh, 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 um, its players from, from black and ethnic minority backgrounds. Um, you could say that that's true of kind of most other sports as well. And there has been a tradition of black players um, playing tennis much, you know, uh, even at Wimbledon. Uh, for a long time, which hasn't been written about very much. But there's no doubt that uh, quite a lot of the uh, black players face discrimination. Uh, in America, they've set up their own tennis organization, you know, for, for black players. At the, at the other end, and also, you know, you have people like Arthur Ashe, who was an incredible campaigner uh, against kind of racism after he stopped playing. But during the time in which he was playing, he adopted an, an, an almost emollient kind of um, style in which he could, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't, um, he accepted everything that the kind of the white tennis establishment kind of suggested. And, you know, shameful episodes around kind of religious discrimination as yes. well. Yes. Uh, yes, there are. I mean, I think um, undoubtedly in the, in the tennis clubs at the time, arguably in the major championships, Jewish people suffered. Uh, 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 an immense amount of discrimination. Um, but I suppose my book 
emphasized how much black players and how much Jewish players, and just like working class players before them, uh, didn't give up on playing tennis. What they did was they formed their own tennis clubs. The Jewish tennis clubs between the war and Britain were extraordinary kind of uh, social and sporting places. And they kept that sort of sense of a, of a, of a, of a sport alive for the community. Um, and, you know, so to the point where, you know, you know, now they've actually virtually disappeared uh, because they've been integrated into, into the system. And imagining kind of uh, North London tennis where I live without, without the Jewish players would be just impossible or so. I think that was true also of black players. They actually had to fight, but it, but it became a place where you could contest racism. And that was a very important part of tennis. And you see, um, and nowadays, um, those players as powerful role models in everything, for example, Black Lives Black Lives. Yes, Matter. and there was a, there was a reason for the the the, fame, the, the Zaka, the uh, and she was kind of um, there. I think that has been uh, a, a good indication of how much those those kind of uh, topics have been immediately been taken up by the elite form. But what you don't read about is actually on 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 the everyday level of playing tennis and. Uh, certainly in London and everywhere I know, I don't think I spoke to quite a lot of ordinary black players for the book. And the, there were virtually no examples of kind of uh, a racism in terms of tennis. It was the whole problem was trying to get black players to play, um, not, not to actually stop them, stop them playing. Uh, and interesting to read of your experience, even of going to Wimbledon last year to the championships um, and your sense of a, of, a, of a crowd that was as diverse as any. I was a bit surprised by that tour. I haven't been to Wimbledon for about 20 years. Um, I always watch on telly. <laughs> it's much, much nicer watching on telly in some ways. Um, but I thought I'd go along, you know, and see what the experience was like. Just, just not, not going onto the main, main, the, the main, main stands, but just wandering around, sitting on Hemman Hill, and uh, just, just having a look, really. And it was very, very diverse. And the amount of languages that have been spoken was, was extraordinary. It didn't feel English at all. Um, it kind of, you know, I was the mixture of classes, the mixture of generation, and the mixture of races. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised by. It really was. It felt a bit like. I know this is a bit odd. But it felt like it's got a stayed, slightly stayed version of Glastonbury. It was just that sense of kind of excitement and kind of mingling. I mean, I remember sitting on Hemman Hill where these four kind of uh, young black lads were knocking back, sort of. Uh, uh, red striped lager, I think, and they were just chatting to these two ladies from the home county while Djokovic was kind of uh, up on screen. And I mean, much as I admire Djokovic, sometimes he can be a bit boring. So I can imagine the conversation was a bit, was more interesting than the tennis on the screen. I mean, if Wimbledon, we see that, or the All England Club as as the most famous club, that's possibly the biggest sort of challenge to the paradigm for your book, isn't it? This idea that sport isn't the tennis isn't the sport of the establishment and yet there's nothing more traditional in many people's eyes than the private tennis club yes but there is in some ways and and the women's of course is a private tennis club the all england lawn tennis club which jealously guards the kind of people that are allowed to be members um i think yes that, that was a that was a challenge um, to try and see how that kind of image of the tennis club that is very much there with people, could be reconciled with my own experience, which actually is that most tennis clubs, even, even the very, very kind of top clubs, um, uh, would are just dying to get new members. <laughs> I mean, they really will work on anybody, you know, as long as they can get the ball over the net uh, or so. Um, and I kind of thought that in that image, some things were being lost. Um, in Wimbledon itself, and the All England Club, I mean, it does have that, that strawberries and cream image that you talked about. There's no, no question about it. But what it also has is an anti-commercialism. I mean, it's kept, you know, all the branding to a very low level. Um, you can see Robinson's, and it's also, you know, allowed little brands like Robinson Barley Water to kind of exist as opposed to Coca-Cola and things like that. So when you go there, you don't get dominated by, uh, by commerce. Uh, and things. I think that is quite a radical way of looking at things. Um, it really is kind of attacking that notion of, you know, sort of money dominating everything. And one of the things I like about the tennis clubs when you actually play in them is that they really are sort of not interested in things like, for example, what kind of status or what kind of job you have. 
I mean, in my tennis club, you just don't know kind of what people do, really. All you know is whether they're any good on the tennis court or whether they're kind of good at, you know, good at the bar, they can chat, or whether they're prepared to kind of mow the lawn or so. And I like that feeling of kind of, you know, once you're in playing tennis with people, that your status or your, or your kind of, uh, you know, job or so, it doesn't really matter, I think. So it's a quite a radical thing for a, a, a club to have, really. I imagine you, you went into the writing of this book with the idea of the All England Club as the kind of panto villain to your thesis, but I get a sense that you're left with a feeling of, of the club as, as a force for good. Well, I think I was more mixed. <laughs> I just said, there's no doubt, you know, as we said, that you, you know, once, once you start looking for, for evidence of the club being in, in, um, in that sort of old kind of fashioned exclusive way, you can find it. I mean, the great, um, you know, sort of a refusal to give Angela Buxton kind of membership in 1959 because arguably she was Jewish. It's still a disgrace and it was never, never kind of uh, rescinded, even though, you know, she, she, she just died a few weeks ago or so. And she would clearly have kind of uh, loved kind of, you know, if they came to her and said, you know, we've got it wrong, but they didn't. And I think that was, a, that was I'm not sure we should use the word black mark on that basis, but certainly was, um, you know, kind of an example of the old fashioned sort of uh, upper middle class style that kind of couldn't care less about people really. Um, and then there are other examples of um, the dis disgraceful Slashinger ball kind of example in 1901, where they decided to give the ball contract, which still exists today, uh, to Slashinger, even though the Ayers ball that was being used was a perfectly good ball or so, because one of the members of the committee happened to kind of know the Slashinger brothers and uh, uh, arguably had been bribed to do it. I mean, you still get those examples in the industry. But overall, I kind of wanted to dislike Wimbledon. I wanted to kind of argue that the All England Club was a bastion of exclusive conservatism. And yet, I, when I started researching it, I found, I found it was more mixed. The people that are running the club are all enthusiasts. <laughs> I thought they'd be air vice marshals or kind of princes or so. But they're basically kind of London solicitors. You know, they're kind of, it, is the, it, is, it does have a kind of, reasonably democratic style about the club and and I think very important for that is that women are just as strongly members on the committee as men or so so I did get the sense that of a more mixed picture I think is the best way to say it. So if we continue that premise of tennis as a, as a radical sport or mm. as a sport for the people and we look at today uh, and and the COVID-19 pandemic situation and certainly we've all experienced just walking around public parks or even trying to book a court. Mm. Uh, but it has led to a, a, a lot of people playing because it's one of the few sports that you can actually take part in at the moment. Um, what do you see as the opportunity around public courts for tennis again to be this radical sport? Yes, well, I think, it, as I said, I don't think it ever, ever stopped being a radical sport in a way. Um, and I, but I do think there are opportunities now. It was it was extraordinary because you know public courts have been haven't been the most packed of, of places in the last kind of ten twenty years. Partly because they've actually uh, a lot of the resources haven't gone into them uh, and things, and they've gone you know they've gone downhill now. Um, but I thought what is, has happened in certainly in some places in London and outside is that private companies uh, or, pri or individuals, non-profit making kind of um, uh, companies run by individuals, have taken over some of the running of, of, of courts and turned them into a, a kind of club which was both um, a, a private club, people could join it, but also was open to people just coming along and, and playing there just like it was a, a public court. And I think they've, they've produced some of the most radical of clubs really uh, in the London parks, I think in Hackney and Stoke Newington and places like that. They really are, have changed the nature of what, um, what a public court tennis can be. Um, I think with COVID, what I noticed most was the amount of families playing tennis. It was like, in some ways, you could say one of the implications of COVID is that people have gone back to the home because they've had to. They were to stay there a lot of the time. And tennis has proved the ideal game for people as a family to go out and do. You've seen families turning up at the tennis courts in a way which you wouldn't have seen for a long time now, really. Um, and that was really heartening. I think people have got the sense that you can do things as a family together, and tennis is a good sport for families to do. 
Um, and finally, I think the, one of the most really interesting things that's happened in the last 20 or 30 years is that people have realized you can play tennis way through to your 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. And the oldest person I interviewed for my book, I was 92. Um, he still plays in Dulwich. Um, and so I think people are sensing that as you get older, tennis is just the right kind of sport. It gives you that kind of physical kind of uh, 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 exercise which you need, but also it's a game, so it's fun and enjoyable. And also provides a social way of connecting with other sort of people, not just from your own gender. You know, uh, I think that's, that's a really good aspect. So I think the veterans tennis is something that is really going to increase in the next few years. Give us that sense of tennis as a social sport, that sense of connection and community that, as you say, both as you get older, but also as we experience um, the pandemic we are now going through why that's so important and what that will do and this can do with that well they've shown i think i think they did a, a, a sort of an there's an analysis of which sports are the healthiest sports you could do and tennis came top because it had that combination of the mental and the physical that sense of you know physical exercise that was that involved you getting out of breath which is very important but also um, that you socialize with people. And we all know that kind of friendship and those connections are really life enhancing, particularly for men. Um, and that is a kind of sport in which you, you get those things. And it's, I, I, even with singles, I, mean, I tend to play doubles, which most people in, in English club tennis play, uh, which is four people on court. But even in singles, there's a real sense of, how can I put this, uh, that your opponent is also your friend. I mean, tennis is one of the only games like that that you have to have an opponent to play with <laughs> i mean with golf you play alongside them but you're playing against yourself but with tennis you have to have an opponent and it's no good if your opponent isn't any good <laughs> in the sense you need your opponent to play well for you to play well so already there's a cooperation going even though you're trying to beat them and then afterwards you come off and you have a coffee or you have a glass of wine or so and that camaraderie that sort of that physical kind of contest creates I think creates a social bond between people, uh, which is uh, can lead to extraordinary friendships, and it has in my case. Um, so, I think there's there's all those social things that you get from tennis that um, you don't quite get from other sports, really. And so, next for you, um, having published a people's history of tennis, is actually that very subject, isn't it? Friendships. I think it's made me think about it, really. I mean, you know, when I got went back to tennis in my 40s, and I think I think like a, a lot of men, I didn't have very many male friends at the time. I've been, you know, with my family a lot and working very hard. And I think to discover a new way of making friendships, first with men and then with women, um, that um, uh, uh, in, in when we played mixed doubles, was an extraordinary revelation. It was just a way of kind of uh, giving me a whole new social network, I think. That's what tennis does. And uh, as a result, I've, start, and I've started thinking about, you know, the role of friendship in people's lives. And so I kind of wonder whether the next topic should be about friendship, really. I think I've written enough about tennis. <laughs> I've got nothing more to say about tennis. <laughs> so I think I need to have a go at something else. <laughs> well, David, thank you for A People's History of Tennis. It's a great read. I thoroughly recommend this. Tell, tell us how uh, people can get hold of that. Uh, it's mostly online, unfortunately. The publishers, um, Pluto Press, the small small publishers, very good. But unfortunately, they had to put all their all their sales force on furlough, <laughs> uh, so they weren't able to go and sell it to the bookshop. So you can mainly uh, uh, you can get it online. Do you want to see a, a copy of it? Um, it's just, Wave uh, it at us. Um, I, so, it's, so it's available online uh, with all the kind of major people like Amazon or Waterstones or W. H. Smith. That's that's the best way to get hold of it. David Berry, thank you very much. Lovely, great pleasure. History of Tennis, available to buy now. Thanks very much.